Israel's foreign minister says international pressure is growing for a ceasefire in Gaza. And major protests have been taking place over the weekend. The police in London now say it was 300,000 people that took part in a pro-Palestinian march. Some of the signs there read, Free Palestine and Stop the Massacre. A different sort of demonstration in Paris on Sunday. 100,000 people or so are believed to have joined a march against anti-Semitism. Shlomo Dovrat is a prominent Israeli tech entrepreneur. He appeared on our show back in March when we were talking about the judicial reforms in Israel and he criticised the Prime Minister Netanyahu's reforms. After October the 7th attack, Dovrat called Israel strong, vibrant and united. And he said his country was on the moral and right side of history. Shlomo Dovrat joins me now from Israel. Good, good evening to you, sir. I'm grateful for your time. Thank you for taking the time. Um, before we get into the ability of Israel to, and if, if you like, in an economic sense, we have to start with the events of the moment. And of course, I guess the issue is how you and others in Israel feel when you hear the Palestinians uh, and, and saying, doctors saying, that premature babies are dying in hospital because the hospitals no longer have fuel and are no longer able to provide life support. So, Richard, obviously, what what is happening in Gaza is heartbreaking. It's uh, when you can't uh, you can't ignore you know pictures of uh, babies dying or or children dead, and and it's heartbreaking for everybody. But in Israel, we have just experienced the worst day in our history, probably the worst day in the history of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. On, on October 7th, 1,400 Israelis were slaughtered, murdered, raped. Babies were burnt. I don't know if you know if you saw any of the videos or any of the pictures, but it is unbearable atrocities. Uh, 3,000 uh, militias or terrorists or whatever the BBC wants to call them now have crossed the border into Israel. We had a ceasefire, by the way, on October 6th. And they went into villages, they went into military camps, and they literally slaughtered 1,400 of our people. And they also took hostage 240 people, including 38 children. Right. So, yes, it is heartbreaking for us. But it is also something that Israel has no choice but to go. And I think that, you know, with all the differences that Israel had prior to this October 7th, Israel is now very united. And 99 percent, including Israeli Arabs, who suffered huge losses as well, are united that we can no longer live with Hamas, a terrorist organization whose right. only okay. goal is to eliminate the Jewish people and to kill everybody. By the way, you, you mentioned the demonstration in London. When those Muslim demonstrator or British demonstrator are calling for free Palestine from the river to the sea, do they really understand what they're saying? What they're really saying is no Jews between the river and the sea mean what? We are supposed to be all dead and, and just do nothing about it. So I think with all the all right. political disputes we had before, we are very determined that Hamas needs to be eliminated. OK, I, I hear what you say. You use the phrase there, you had no choice, or Israel had no choice, bearing in mind. And um, I guess there will be an argument that says, all right, even if there are Hamas in that hospital, under that hospital, does that still justify what's being done to the patients within? So I'm not part of the military operation, obviously, but I, to the best of my knowledge, Israel has not entered any hospital which has patient. On the other hand, Israel has been shot at, including rockets. By the way, a few days ago, a house just three streets from me was destroyed by a rocket that may have been shot from one of the hospitals in Gaza. We are being attacked. Israel on October 7th has been attacked. We are defending ourselves. If the Hamas is choosing uh, kids and hospitals and mosques and school as a way to shield themselves from the Israeli going after them, then we have no choice. Israel, as far as I know, has not entered a single hospital, has allowed evacuation of all the patients. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, except the Shifa hospital, all the other hospitals are now evicted. In the, and in the Shifa hospital, there are only a few hundreds left after there were 50,000. So Israel is not a barbarian country. Unlike Hamas, we are a liberal democratic country okay. who upholds the moral justice.
And I believe that Israel is doing all the necessary precaution to try and minimize those casualties. But as you said yourself, uh, uh, Richard, war is nasty. And at this point, we have a vicious enemy, and there is no choice. We, we abide by international laws. We consider every I, attack and every action. I used to be a military officer. I know how it works. You know, I think Israel is a very proud uh, democracy who, who really is abiding by all international war laws. Can I just, all right, so, so if, we, if we move this forward, I mean, is there a risk here that, yeah, the, the overwhelming force that Israel can bring to bear suggests and probably means that, I mean, you, you, you know, the country will prevail in its, in, its, in its armed struggle, if you will. But you, you risk sort of winning the war and losing the peace. Because now turning to your sort of role as an entrepreneur and as a, a understanding the mechanisms of the Israeli economy, what happens if Israel becomes a pariah state where people don't want to invest? I don't think there is any risk of that because I think Israel, nobody in Israel or the vast majority of Israelis don't want to rule Gaza. We, we want to go in, we want to destroy Hamas, and then we want... Remember, in 2005, Israel left Gaza. Gaza is not an occupied territory. Gaza was ruled by the Palestinian Authority, which has a peace accord with Israel. And in 2007, just two years after we left, the Hamas overthrew violently their own uh, uh, you know, brothers, the Palestinian Authority, and have created a monster. They've built the terror tunnels in, in, uh, in uh, Gaza, which is actually bigger than the subway system uh, of New York. They've spent every, actually there is more international aid put into Gaza than the Marshall right. Plan in, that was put into Europe. So the future in Israel is to have a legitimate which is internationally recognized, legitimate country with legitimate borders. I hope and I pray, and I am one of the people, like many of us, who have been fighting for a two-state solution. I think Hamas is the biggest enemy of the Palestinian uh, people. Many of us, okay. many of the uh, people I, that have been slaughtered, I, let me jump do in support here, that. I if I may. That when so, this war is I, over, Richard, if I may just finish, I think when this war is over, we need to work diligently on peace. We need to work diligently on coexistence. I would love to see a Palestinian state, a peace-seeking Palestinian state. I believe that we do have the legitimacy. I think we have the support of President Biden, uh, uh, you know, your Prime Minister Sunak, uh, you know, Germany and many others. Everybody supports, everybody recognizes that we need to eliminate Hamas. Nevertheless, Israel has a huge responsibility to continue and strive for peace. This is why we will be internationally accepted and very legitimate because of who we are. OK, uh, just to explain to viewers who may hear me uh, speaking over you, uh, you and I are actually physically not that far away from each other. I'm in Dubai and uh, you're, you're in, in Tel Aviv. But, the, of course, the way the, uh, <laughs> the satellites work, uh, it's taking a little bit longer to get from one to the other and back again. On this question of... Israel's ability. The central bank is going to have to provide huge amounts of liquidity. The market is already under pressure. The shekel has fallen. So a wartime economy and for a country that had made its name as the startup nation, I guess there's, 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 there's it's very difficult now to, to, to move forward as a, in that sense. Because for the foreseeable future, you're going to be dealing with this. So, you know, Israel has entered this crisis in uh, one of the best uh, situation ever. Israel debt to, to GDP ratio is only 60 percent, which is one of the lowest in the OECD. Israel has a huge economical surplus. Israel has a huge uh, over 200 billion dollars of uh, reserves. So Israel economy is very strong and very sound and I believe can sustain this uh, crisis from a macroeconomic. I think the government will need to be fiscally responsible. They will have to give up on some of their political agenda and make sure that all that, uh, surp all right. that uh, deficit that we will definitely need will only be used to the war. I think the biggest engine of growth in Israel has been the high-tech industry. High-tech is a global business. It's not as affected. It's actually 17% of GDP, by far the largest uh, and, and the most important industry in the country. And I believe the Israeli high-tech will continue to thrive. And it actually already is. You know, right. our 
day-to-day uh, uh, -day life is now we are moving. Israelis are very resilient. We moved back to work quite quickly. Yes, we do have sirens. We have to go to shelter once in a while. I hope we don't have one as uh, you interview me now. Uh, but we are continuing to invest. We are continuing to deliver. Uh, we just had okay. a big sign on Nasdaq saying we deliver no matter what. All right. Can I, can I ask you, finally, because when you and I spoke uh, in, in, in Israel, we, we talked about the judicial reforms, um, which you, you were very forthright uh, about against. You said in your recent blog, when this is over, we will find out what happened, make the necessary adjustments and hold those responsible accountable. Well, obviously, you know, you'll expect me to say the, you do hold the prime minister responsible, but, but more nuanced than that. Do you think the preoccupation with the judicial reforms meant that everybody simply took their eye off the security question? I, I really don't think that the military failure is a direct result of the political ref, uh, uh, judicial reform or the political dispute. Uh, I think that there, there was a, a conceptual policy uh, wrong for many, many years that we were trying to accommodate uh, Hamas, we were trying to live with the Hamas, this is predating, this is a probably 15 year old. I think the military failure, the miserable, the un, you know, incomprehensible military failure of, you know, Israel is such a, a mighty uh, uh, country with an amazing superpower uh, military, but we simply failed in, in, in uh, staying the guard. All this is nothing to do with the judicial reform. However, I think the fact the country was divided, I think the fact the country was torn, I think the fact that some of our international investors started to lose faith in the country and in the institution was very dangerous. I do believe and I do, uh, and I'm very confident that after this, when this war is over, and if and when we, and not if, when we win against Hamas, Israel will be rebuilt. I think we're more united than ever. I think the judicial reform is dead. I do think that the Israeli public right. will hold everybody, and I mean everybody, the military, the political leadership, who were responsible for this terrible uh, failure, uh, they will, we will hold them accountable. And then the, Israel is a democracy, and we will let the electorate decide who the next leaders of this country are. But I'm sure the next leaders of this country will be rebuilding right. the country, will strengthen the institution, and Israel will continue to thrive. Shlomo, I'm grateful for your time tonight, as always. Thank you, sir, for joining us from Israel.